Okay, good evening, everybody. Hello and welcome to the Cayley Club. This is the 1916 committee lecture series. Uh, I thought about this today. We've been doing these monthly lectures for eight years now. We take the summer off, but we've covered a broad range of topics. Tonight's topic is going to be fascinating, I'm sure. True crime stories always are. Paul Caranci, we're so happy he's here. But the 1916 committee is involved in more than the lecture series. Uh, we have been actively campaigning around the Brexit campaign, where the United Kingdom left the European Union, posing a great threat to Ireland, a great threat to the peace in Ireland. The possibility still, still exists that there'll be a hard border reinstituted around the six counties. Uh, I'm not going to go on about it, but that's one of our main political activities. Anybody who is interested could speak to me later. I'll get you on a mailing list and you'll get suggestions as to how to lobby your Congress people and things like that. Uh, on the tables, there is a uh, flyer advertising the hunger strike commemoration. This is an annual event that Irish Northern Aid has held every year since 1981. This is in honor of the 10 men who died on hunger strike fighting Margaret Thatcher's criminalization policy. It'll take place down at the Rhode Island Famine Memorial site, downtown Providence on the river. Uh, it'll start at 6.30. There'll be a couple of speeches. There'll be some music, appropriate songs about the hunger strikers. And uh, after that, we're going up to Patrick's Pub for a social with some live music up there. Everyone is welcome to come and attend. Coincidentally, on May 5th, the same day, that's next Thursday, there's an election in the United Kingdom. Be good to pay attention to what happens in the six counties of Ireland. For the very first time, it could be that the elected leader is not going to be a unionist or a Protestant. But that's polling data, and we don't trust polls. <laughs> I mean, he decided it led. <laughs> so anyway, but that's a it's a, an important day. Uh, May 12th is going to be a meeting of the 1916 committee at Patrick's Pub. And on May 21st, there is going to be a fundraiser at the Galway Bay Irish Pub in Pawtucket. The fundraiser is an, for the 1916 committee's campaign to build a monument at the famine site in honor of the 10 hunger strikers. Again, if anyone wants information about that, please uh, talk to me after the event. May 28th, there'll be another lecture here. A funny story that happened, we have a very active member named Marie McGee. She went to Ireland 10 days ago, the uh, Ancient Order of Hibernians. She's a ladies, Ancient Order of Hibernians. Every year the Hibernians have a Christmas fundraiser where they get collect money and they give grants to organizations in the six counties that are working for peace and reconciliation. Marie went over to be a part of that. Friday morning, she was supposed to fly back. She tested positive for COVID. She has to stay five more days. Oh, no. She's up in Armagh with Kathy Greenwell's cousin. She sent pictures today. She's having a good time <laughs> and has no symptoms. So it does As we were saying before, if you're going to get stuck somewhere for five days, Ireland is probably the best place. Uh, another thing in the back of the room, you'll see Eileen's back there. There's a raffle. This is uh, very important for us, what we do is every time we have a lecture, we try to raise some money and that's how we pay for the music downstairs in the band. So please give generously and you know take a chance. Maybe you'll win something really nice. But that's enough of that. Paul is gonna take over. This, as the song says, has been a long, cold, lonely winter. Paul was supposed to be here in February. It got postponed till today because of bad weather. We gotta move it back. And we thank Paul for his understanding and we appreciate his patience of waiting, but at long last, here it is. Now, uh, interestingly enough, this is the Cranston Herald, came out yesterday, front page article, learning about Rhode Island's last execution. Rhode Island is one of 23 states that does not have capital punishment. Author Paul Caranci will tell the story of the last person executed in the state. His presentation will be sponsored by the 1916 committee 
on Friday, April 29th at the Rhode Island, Isle, Rhode Island Cayley Club, 50 America Street, Cranston, beginning at 7.30. Sean Connell will provide music downstairs after the lecture. We invite everyone to go down. So this is the work of Ann McCarthy, who is here somewhere. And it's not easy to get publicity anymore. The newspapers are dying. And you know, she, I know she's all the time on these websites and go local and RI News and everything like that. It's a struggle, but this is a, a, a real good testimony here. Now, uh, in 2011, John Gordon was pardoned by Governor Chafee at the time. And this is quite a story. I'm not going to tell the story. Paul knows the story. He can tell it. But what it showed was many people in the Irish American community in Rhode Island came together in a lobbying effort to get the legislation passed, to get the pardon officially signed. And uh, the result is a book here that we could buy afterwards. And uh, Paul will tell the story in a much better way. When Paul finishes, he encourages questions and answers. And uh, once that is over, Paul will obviously sign books, sell books, and do whatever an author is supposed to do at these things. So let's have Paul come up and dazzle us with the story. All right? <laughs> Thank you, Jim. It, the um, little side story. Uh, right after writing this book in 2013, I was invited to speak at the Jimmy Carter Library Museum in Atlanta, Georgia, because at the time um, there was a, a man named Troy Davis, black man who was accused of killing a, a white off-duty police officer and um, six witnesses, mm -hmm. eyewitnesses came forward and said that he committed the murder. And over the course of the 20 years that he was on death row, five of those six witnesses recanted the story saying the police forced them to identify Troy Davis. Uh, the sixth one, the only reason that person didn't recant is because along those 20 years he had died. Uh, there were letters written by Desmond Tutu, President Carter, you name it, are all urging a new trial for Troy Davis, but the courts refused to give him one, similar to the Gordon story, and he was executed by lethal injection. So because of the similarities, here we were in Rhode Island pardoning uh, John Gordon, and in Georgia they're executing a man under similar circumstances. So because of that irony, they invited me to speak there. Now the reason I tell you that story is, um, Initially, Jim, Jim said I was supposed to speak in, in uh, January, February, but it's actually March 13th of 2020 <laughs> was the date I was supposed to be here. And then there was a, there was a pandemic and then there a couple of other resurgence of, of the, and then the snowstorm and, and here we are. So the reason I told you that other story is it took less time to arrange travel, only two months to arrange travel, lodging, and a presentation for the Carter Library and Museum. And it took us two years to get to Cranston. So <laughs> I'm not sure what that says about Rhode Island. But what it doesn't say, the, the story about John Gordon will, will certainly say. About 200 years after Roger Williams and his band of loyal countrymen arrived in Rhode Island, Nicholas Gordon immigrated from, not from England as did those predecessors, but from the colony of Ireland. Gordon left his home in search of a better life here in America, one that would be free from the hardships of the coming famine, economic depression, and British dominance. In America, the land of riches, he'd be free to both control his own destiny and practice his religious faith without fear of reprisal. Arriving in 1836, Gordon moved to Cranston where many of his countrymen had already made residence. He worked hard, he made many friends, and opened his own store in rented quarters in Knightsville, right here. Monkey Town is the Yankee establishment, like to refer to it. And there he sold groceries and candy, notions, uh, such as needles, threads, pins, tape, that kind of thing. His business was good, and soon he was able to relocate to Spriggsville, a small mill village controlled by the wealthy and politically powerful Sprague family. 
The Sprague roots ran deep in America with the arrival of Ralph, Richard, and William Sprague in 1628, two years before Roger Williams stepped foot onto the shores of Salem, Massachusetts. Generations later, in about the year 1710, a wealthy and politically powerful William Sprague, along with his wife Mary, moved to Rhode Island. There they expanded their family, their wealth, and their political influence, all which continued to grow over the course of future generations. By the time that Nicholas Gordon arrived in 1836, mm -hmm. the Sprague family influence was legendary. They controlled several mills in Rhode Island, including the A&W Sprague Mill in Cranston. They employed entire mill villages of Irish immigrants and pretty much controlled the local political structure with family members uh, serving at various times on the town council, in the state legislature, as governor, and in the United States Senate. While not born to privilege, Nicholas Gordon was a hard and focused worker. He longed for a time when he could reunite with his family here in America. By 1840, I should stop and tell you that, uh, this is what happens when you invite an Italian to address a, a, an Irish subject. <laughs> Technology always fails when, when it's in my hands. And um, for some reason, the projector isn't showing the full slides, it's distorting. Um, them a little bit too. So I apologize if you can't read the whole thing. So um, Nicholas Gordon, uh, long for, okay, in 1840, he had learned his way around the political process enough to apply for and be granted a liquor license to sell alcohol by the bottle in his store. The profits were enough for him to purchase a piece of land for $200 and build on it his own store, complete with a second floor apartment. During this time, Gordon had also become a naturalized citizen. For hunting and possibly for protection against intruders in the store, he purchased a handgun and a rifle from the auction and uh, store of Tillinghast Army. While his business was certainly successful, he knew that a tavern license, one that would allow for the sale of alcohol by the drink rather than the bottle, would be much more lucrative. He worked toward that and then by summer of 1842, the council granted his application for a tavern or ale license, just in time for him to take advantage of the sales opportunity from the prominence of his new storefront, with, complete with the second floor apartment, on which he had taken occupancy in August of that same year. In April of 1843, the council granted a three-month extension, which was typical at the time, of the tavern license, and the profits were so brisk that he arranged for the passage of his entire family, which allowed them to join him here in America. The arrangements were made through the Jeremiah Baggett Company, a local agent of the Joseph Murray Company out of New York. And Nicholas paid for the passage of his mother, Ellen, his brothers, John, William, and Robert, his sister, Margaret, and William's seven-year-old daughter, also named Margaret. The family arrived in New York on June 19, 1843, and were met by Nicholas in what had to be a most joyous reunion. Just seven years earlier, Nicholas waved goodbye to them at the, to start his new life here in America, never knowing if he'd ever see them again. Now here they were, joining him in America, and it was all made possible because of his success as a businessman. His mother must have been bursting with pride to, to see what her eldest son had accomplished, and all of them must have been excited beyond words at the prospect of beginning their own new lives here in the land of abundance and opportunity. Just a few weeks later, however, the sweet taste of Nicholas's success, Nicholas's success, say that three times fast, <laughs> would begin to sour. Amasa Sprague was tired of his Irish employees getting drunk on his time. Workers were drinking during lunch and before and after work. The liquor was affecting their work performance. Employees were coming to work late or even worse, drunk. <coughs> Work-related accidents were increasing and productivity was suffering. And Amasa blamed the Gordons. He accused him of selling alcohol to the Sprague employees from his store across the street from the mill. He made a move to take away Gordon's liquor license. And just a few weeks after the arrival of his entire family, the Cranston Town Council at the urging of Amasa Sprague, a former councilman himself, voted to not renew the liquor license of Nicholas Gordon. In a flash, 
Nicholas, who had just taken on the full financial responsibility of his entire family, lost a significant amount of his income. Nicholas was confused and upset. He hadn't been selling liquor to the mill workers during the workday and believed that Joe Wilbur, a local store owner who didn't even have a license to sell alcohol, was providing the drinks to the employees, perhaps even illegally. While all this was going on, political tensions had been heating up in Providence. In an oversimplification of a very complex set of events, Thomas Wilson Dorr, himself a product of the wealthy and politically powerful family, believed that the state was in need of a new constitution, one that would better apportion the members of the state legislature and eliminate the land ownership requirement as a condition of suffrage. His reform efforts, though appropriate and just, were not received well by the Yankee establishment. In 1842, the state held two competing sets of elections and the election uh, resulting in the election of two competing legislatures and two governors, each claiming power at the same time. Though the smallest state in the union had two governors and two sets of legislators. Thomas Dorr proclaimed himself the people's governor while Samuel Ward King of Johnston, the law and order governor. The refusal of either to relinquish power to the other led to an uprising which has since become known as the Dorr Rebellion. King took his case to the Rhode Island Supreme Court, where Chief Justice Job Durfee ruled in his favor, calling any attempts by the People's Party to assume power treasonous. Arrest warrants were issued for Dorr and his followers, and political tensions were high everywhere. The Yankee establishment, which tended to blame all things on the Irish, tried to assign them this burden as well. The Yankees fueled the fires of bigotry in their opposition to Dorr and its attempts at expanded suffrage using broadsides and the Providence Journal to incite fear into the hearts of the citizenry. As one broadside warned, approving the people's constitution would quote, place your government, your civil and political institutions, your public schools, and perhaps your religious privileges under the control of the Pope of Rome through the medium of thousands of naturalized foreign Catholics. This was the heated and explosive atmosphere that existed on December 31, 1843. For on that day, after having had lunch with his family in celebration of his wife Fanny's 40, 45th birthday, and though expecting guests at a New Year's Eve celebration at the mansion, Amasso left his house to ostensibly check the fires in the furnace at his mill across the street, and then his livestock on his farm just over the town border into Johnston. It was an extremely cold and windy day, and the night promised to be even colder. Reading from a few pages of the book, or a few paragraphs of the book, Amasso Sprague, meanwhile, continued on his journey. He could feel every gust of the icy wind snap against the flesh of his cheeks. Adjusting his collar upward, he quickened his pace, hoping to hasten the, his journey so that he could check his stock before the sun had completely disappeared from the deep blue afternoon sky. It was about four o'clock when Sprague reached the Spring Bridge, the footpath that crossed, the, crossed over the Pocasset River. He had crossed into Johnston and Sprague saw from the corner of his eye a man approaching from his left side. As he came closer, Sprague noticed the man pull a gun from his coat and pointed it at his head. Raising his arm in a defensive posture, he felt the sting of a lead ball pierce his right forearm at about the knuckle of his wrist, almost at the same time that he heard the sound of the gun gunshot. The blast drilled a four inch long path through Sprague's forearm, coming to rest just prior to exiting at the wrist. Reacting to the severe rush of pain, he instinctively reached for his right arm with his left hand, turning as he did to head back toward the Cranston side of the bridge. He staggered toward the bridge in an effort to escape his assailant, but as he did, Sprague felt a crushing blow on the back of his head, and then another. The first strike knocked the hat off his head and opened two parallel gashes on the upper back of his head, each measuring about an inch in length. The second hit opened a three inch wound that started at the point of the first gash and extended backward to about one inch above the ear. Almost as if forgetting the pain of his bloodied forearm, Sprague turned and tried to grab the man with his still useful left hand. 
Sprig was uncommonly stout, measuring just under six feet and weighing almost 200 pounds. He was a very athletic man of determined courage, yet the assailant made the skirmish seem insignificant. The assassin reached out with his left hand, grabbing Sprig by the chin. As he did, he lifted his right arm and with the gun firmly in hand, brought it down hard on Sprig's upper forehead, splitting the left side wide open with an inch and a half gash, cracking the skull and lacerating the membrane, causing brain matter to spill out while spray spraying blood in all directions. Dazed and losing consciousness, Sprig continued to his struggle to get away, staggering toward the edge of the bridge were collapsing to his knees about 15 feet short of reaching it. Spray could feel the warmth of his own blood streaming across his icy face. Seeing that there was still life left in his victim, the attack, attacker used, raised his right arm again, using all his strength, slammed the gun down against the front of Sprague's face. There was an audible sound of crushing bone and the force of the blow broke the gun into several pieces shattered Sprague's nose and caused a contusion that extended from the cheekbone to the temple. The temple bone now depressed the cheekbone together with a large portion of bone that had once formed the right side of Sprague's face. Sprague collapsed into the snow. He could no longer feel the pain of his wounds, but he could detect the life ooze from his body as he took his last breath. His shattered nose partially buried in the snow, his hands pinned under his massive frame. Almost immediately upon learning the news of the murder, stories started to circulate regarding threats made by Nicholas Gordon against the Master Sprague for his role in the denial of Gordon's liquor license renewal. He and his family were implicated in adverse stories reported in the Providence Journal even before the first shred of evidence was found. Facts were distorted by mindless fiction and the pot of emotion started to boil over. Rather than look for evidence that might expose the perpetrator, Attention was narrowed to focus only on evidence that might implicate the Gordon family. Nicholas and John were arrested by Sheriff Potter the day after the murder, even before a single shred of evidence was found. And unskilled, untrained volunteer investigators began their effort to find or fabricate evidence against the Gordons. On the second day after the murder, Ellen, Robert, and William Gordon were also arrested, as was close family friend Michael O'Brien. Even the Gordon family dog was arrested, so the sheriff could try to match the dog prints uh, against prints found at the scene or at or near the scene of the crime. <clears throat> now, the Gordon family dog was described by those who knew it as a good old dog, as feeble and harmless a mud as there could be. The Gordons had not known him to ever hurt a single living thing. He could barely walk and didn't have a tooth left in his head. Yet the description of the dog that appeared in the Providence Journal the next day would have left you wondering if they were describing the same animal. Reading from page 103, regarding the arrest of Gordon's family dog, a journal reporter wrote, close to the tracks of a man, of, um, yeah, close to the tracks of a man found leading to the swamp were tracks of a dog. Nicholas Gordon owns a ferocious dog. He was found in his shop by Officer Shaw who had to force down the dog. The dog wears a collar of jagged metal and some of the wounds against Mr. Sprague are such as would have been made by such a collar on a dog springing at his throat. The crime scene and surrounding area were trampled by tens of volunteers that joined the effort to find clues. Yet only those clues that conveniently fit the theory of Gordon's guilt were examined. For example, despite the presence of tracks in the snow that led in many directions, only those tracks that led to Nicholas's door were followed and measured. All the other tracks were ignored, even altered by the searchers. Even the gun, which was found in pieces from its beating against a massive skull, was assumed to be the one owned by Nicholas at the, and purchased at the store of Tillinghouse Army, despite all hard evidence of that fact being absent. It was only because those who searched the Gordon store initially failed to find a gun, which at the time of the first search was in, in plain view behind the counter, that the gun found at the scene could even have been alleged to be the one belonging to Nicholas. Despite the search for evidence and after many other assumptions were made absent valid, valid logic or reason, evidence was brought to the mansion for safekeeping rather than being left 
with the sheriff, completely destroying any semblance of a pure chain of evidence. Former governor and now Senator William Sprague, who clearly had no pretense of impartiality, resigned his Senate seat so as to lead the investigation. And the testimony of critical eyewitnesses was dismissed if their story did not support the presumption of Gordon's guilt. The state's case was built entirely on circumstantial evidence, but incredibly Judge Durfee took great pains to explain to the jury how circumstantial evidence can be even more com conclusive than eyewitness testimony, since it had to be corroborated by more than one witness. After all the evidence was gathered, only three members of the Gordon family were indicted. John and William were charged as principals in the murder of Amasa Sprague, while Nicholas was charged with being an accessory before the fact. At trial, the judge made several other decisions that left the Gordons, who at this time should still have been presumed innocent, at a severe disadvantage. For example, a decision was made to hold the trials of William and John together rather than to separate them, creating the potential for a jury to be prejudiced against one brother because of evidence presented against the other. Evidence placing Nicholas's gun in the hands of John and William was allowed even before it was determined that Nicholas's gun was the murder weapon. A prostitute implied that she was far more than a mere casual acquaintance of John and William, Gordon having shopped at Nick's store as many as five times a week. Yet when asked to point them out at the defendant's table, she misidentified John as William and William as John. Witnesses for the prosecution several times fumbled their testimony and offered testimony that at other times contradicted the testimony of others. Meanwhile, tens of witnesses, most of them of Irish descent, testified that the Gordons were elsewhere when the crime was committed, though their stories were consistent uh, from one to the other. Judge Durfee instructed the jury to place less value on the testimony of the Irishman and to consider with greater reliance the testimony of others. In the end, it still came down to a jury decision, which was rendered on Wednesday, April 17th. Again, reading from the book, with Durfee's reverberating judicial challenge, the jury retired to an anteroom for deliberations and the court recessed pending its verdict. The hour was six o'clock in the evening and Carpenter, the defense attorney, spoke to his clients briefly before they were led away, reassuring them that they had a good chance of winning acquittal based on the evidence presented during the trial. Yet as he walked off, he bowed his head and must have wondered if the facts presented at trial, coupled with the judge's instructions to the jury, would be of sufficient weight to sway the jury members away from a verdict of guilty. He wouldn't have to wait too long for his answer. At a quarter before eight, with the jury having deliberated for only an hour and 45 minutes, Carpenter was summoned back to the courtroom. A verdict had been reached. Carpenter knew that such a quick decision didn't bode well for his clients. But as they reunited in the courtroom, they just sat stoically and looked straight ahead. No words needed to be spoken by the jury members or as the jury members filed into the room and took their seats. The court clerk faced the jurors and asked sternly, have you agreed upon a verdict? We have, Foreman J.C. Hidden answered. The clerk then inquired, gentlemen of the jury, who shall speak for you? Our foreman was the unanimous and choreographed reply. The clerk turned to John and William and instructed prisoners, look on the jurors. John glanced at William, his heart sank in his chest and he trembled with anticipation as he turned to face the 12 men who held his very life in their hands. Jurors, look on the prisoners, the clerk continued. What say you, Mr. Foreman? Is John Gordon guilty or not guilty? Guilty, the foreman answered. John felt his knees begin to buckle. As the importance of their words began to take hold, the clerk asked, gentlemen of the jury, as your foreman hath said, so do you all say? We do, the jury answered in unison. Before William could even digest what had just taken place, the clerk turned to him. Prisoner, look on the jurors. Jurors, look on the prisoner. What say you, Mr. Foreman? Do you find William <coughs> Gordon guilty? Not guilty, the foreman said. There was an audible gasp from the men who had assembled to view the proceedings. The clerk recorded the verdict and finished, 
Gentlemen of the jury, hearken to your verdict as the court have recorded it. We find William Gordon not guilty. Is that your verdict, gentlemen? It is, they replied. William Gordon, you are discharged, Judge Jeffrey said. As he said this, John looked at his brother exclaiming, it is you, William, who have hung me. Carpenter looked bewildered and wondered what he meant. But before he had a chance to ask, John was bound and led away by the sheriff. Over the course of the ensuing months, the meaning of that statement along with its, its implications would become abundantly clear. Lawyers for the defense immediately asked that the sentencing of John Gordon be delayed until after the trial of Nicholas. They were aware that some of the fabricated evidence against John might be dispelled during the trial of Nicholas, opening the door of appeal to John. Jeffrey denied the motion, saying that a swift hanging would serve as a deterrent to other criminals and as an example to all. John Gordon was led into court the next day and a sentence of death by hanging was pronounced upon him. The defense then submitted a motion for a new trial, but a decision on that motion was put off until the October term of the court. When the hearing date finally arrived on October 9th, Justice Durfee in record time ruled against the defense motion, thereby denying Gordon of a new trial. So two weeks before the start of the trial of Nicholas Gordon, John Gordon was sentenced to be hanged in the yard of the state prison on February 14, 1845. Looking at John, Durfee asked, why should the sentence of death not be imposed on you? Numb to the court ruling, Gordon stated, uh, stood tall and replied, gentlemen, these may be my last words. I therefore here declare that I never had hand, act, or part in the murder of Mr. Sprague. I never had hand, act, or part in the murder of any man, woman, or child. I further declare that I never knew that gentleman. My persecutors and my prosecutors have wickedly and maliciously sworn away my life. And it is always more easy to do to a stranger than towards someone who is well known. I have no more than this to say. Gordon's lack of remorse clearly irritated the judge. Nicholas Gordon's trial began 10 days later on October 19th. As John Gordon's defense team had surmised, the statements of perjured witnesses were not consistent during that trial and their stories fell apart. The trial ended in a hung jury. The state vowed to retry him but it was too late for John. In January, 1845, with time running out, two petitions requesting postponement of the execution were submitted to the General Assembly, each signed by numerous members of the public, including clergymen. The House petition failed on a vote of 36 to 27. The Senate vote failed by a larger margin. Then eight days after the legislative votes were taken, William Gordon made an astonishing revelation. He disclosed to a close friend that he had hidden the two guns owned by Nicholas after the arrest of John and Nicholas. William was convinced to reveal his secret to authorities who in fact were led to the weapons. This was strong evidence that Nicholas's gun was not the murder weapon, meaning that John more than likely was not the murderer. Appeals were made to Governor James Fenner begging that the execution be delayed until after the second trial of Nicholas, where this new evidence could be produced. On February 10th, just four days before the execution was scheduled to be carried out, Governor Fenner denied the request, citing his inability under the constitution to grant a reprieve after the legislative session during which the sentence was imposed had passed. Despite the overwhelming lack of evidence of his guilt, John Gordon was out of options. More importantly, he was out of time. He didn't spend his last three days on earth lamenting the decisions by the court, the General Assembly, the governor, nor did he curse his detractors. He pragmatically approached his own demise. He expressed his forgiveness of William, who visited John every day until the last. At about 10 o'clock in the morning of February 14, 1845, prison guards ex escorted John's brother William and Father John Brady, the parish priest from the church of Saints Peter and Paul, into John's cell. John was pale and haggard, the result of months of anguish and incarceration with felons. 
The three men talked and traded in John's cell for about an hour, what surely seemed the quickest hour since his incarceration so many months ago. At 11 o'clock, the sheriff entered the cell and appearing visually affected, adjusted John's white cap and robe. As they took what would be John's final walk, he was calm and composed as if nothing were about to transpire. In the corridor, John met his brother Nicholas, who he had not seen in almost a year, though incarcerated in the same prison. The two embraced in a long farewell, at which time John urged Nicholas, I want to repeat that, John, 29-year-old boy who was about to be executed for a crime he clearly did not commit, was encouraging his older brother to take courage and not be downhearted. They soon parted company, and John left the confines of his cold, damp, and personal prison walls for the last time. As he walked through the steel door and into the biting wintry chill of the prison yard, he gazed at those assembled to witness his demise. The sheriff and Father Brady accompanied John up the stairs of the scaffold that had been constructed in the prison yard. Here in plain view of the 60 witnesses allowed to attend the execution, the prisoner, prisoner was expected to confess his guilt. It was customary in such settings for the guilty man to ask, no, to beg the forgiveness of God and his fellow man. But today's events would not follow the customary script. Neither did Father Brady's final words to a condemned man follow the expected ritual of platitudinous spiritual solace for a remorseful or guilty criminal. Father Brady said simply, have courage, John. You are going to appear before a just and merciful judge. You are going to join the myriads of your countrymen who, like you, were sacrificed at the shrine of bigotry and prejudice. Forgive your enemies. Gordon looked longingly at his priest and responded in the words of his savior, I do. I forgive all my enemies and persecutors. I forgive them because they know not what they do. He looked to the crowd assembled and said, I hope all good Christians here will pray for me. Then Gordon faced the sheriff and with a nod of his head, he said, I'm ready. A handkerchief that was given to John by his mother was used to cover his eyes. It was tied around his head and the noose fixed tightly upon his neck. As he stepped in onto the trap door, he seemed to falter. But within seconds, anti-gallows judge William Staples pulled the lever, releasing the platform from beneath John's feet. The fall and the sudden stop of the rope as it reached its limit snapped John's neck. His body jerked from side to side as the last vestige of life left his dangling body. Death was almost instantaneous, yet as if in retribution for the perceived lack of remorse and his failure to admit guilt, John's body was left hanging in the gallows for over 20 minutes. When finally removed from beneath the platform, John's limp body was placed in the coffin that was simply inscribed, John Gordon, aged 29 years. The death of John Gordon was tragic, but the impact of Gordon's fate, driven by bigotry and hatred that led to his execution, reverberated throughout his family and possibly throughout an entire society and culture. Nicholas was jailed from January 1, 1843, until his release following a hung jury in his second trial which ended on April 17, 1845. Those two years and four months of incarceration in a cold, damp prison cell with felons and others who tend to make life miserable took its toll on his health. He died at the age of about 30 in Octo on October 22, 1846, leaving behind significant debt for which his brother William was arrested and incarcerated. To understand the impact of incarceration on anyone, but in this case, John and William and Nicholas Gordon. It's important to understand the conditions that existed in Rhode Island's prisons at the time. The first state prison was built in Rhode Island following a 13, an 1834 realization that there was a, such an acute need for a state facility rather than a series of local prisons that existed at the time. The facility was constructed in the Pennsylvania style, that's to say, with single cells allowing for a system of solitary confinement with no work opportunities. In this style, the prisoner would be able to contemplate his sins 
and do penance for his crime. The building was completed in 1838 and prison is transferred from local jails to the new facility. It was soon evident that conditions had not improved with the building of a new facility. It was possible still to scrape frost off the inside walls in the winter and heating was extremely poor. Prisoners were never allowed to leave their cells. Prisoners' mental condition deteriorated with nothing to occupy their minds. Individuals, uh, individual work was given but to be done in their cells. The prisoners work, took, worked, took meals, slept, went to the bathroom, all in the same small enclosure. No prisoners were made, uh, no provisions rather, were made for exercise for the, of the prisoners. And the inmates didn't know the identity of the person in the, in the next cell. Conditions were so deplorable that by 18, uh, 1841, six of the original 37 inmates had become hopelessly insane and several others emotionally unbalanced. These conditions were not considered unusual or inhumane. Similar conditions were standard throughout the United States during this period. Eventually, the solitary system of segregation began to break down. The emphasis shifted from single, a single goal of uh, state profit to one of rehabilitation for the inmates themselves. Even so, rules of this period, then considered mild, were rigid compared to the present day standards. During this time, inmates were compelled to work from sunrise to sunset at hard labor with little time out for meals. A well-behaved inmate was allowed one warm bath every three months and no visits were allowed except in cases of serious illness. Yet the general public was still indignant at what they perceived the coddling of inmates. Prison was certainly considered a place of punishment rather than a place of reformation. The popular sentiment during this period in history is that hard work, long hours and a strict upbringing was the norm as it built character. Prison then should be no different, and they weren't. William never truly recovered from his own guilt of knowing that his actions, his fear of telling the truth about hiding Nicholas's guns and his failure to disclose his role until just days before John's execution may have played a significant role in his own brother's guilty verdict and hanging. His later incarceration for Nicholas's debt further exacerbated, exacerbated his depression. Once released from prison, he became a raging and dysfunctional alcoholic. He spent the better part of his life in and out of the Dexter Asylum on the east side of Providence, the very spot now occupied by the Brown Athletic Complex. Between 1851 and 1862, he was admitted to the asylum six times, remaining there for a total of almost 900 days or the better part of three years. Each time he would sober up and release himself against his doctor's wishes until he finally succumbed to the effects of alcoholism on May 8, 1862, at the age of about 49. Ellen Gordon lived out her years under the threat of arrest for Nicholas's debt. She had purchased Nicholas's home for one dollar at some point following his arrest or release from prison. But on January 5th, 1842, 1852, she lost the house at a public auction for $1.20 owed to the city. She rented an apartment at 17 Pond Street in Providence, where she cared for William, who lived with her when he wasn't an inmate at the asylum. Her life had been destroyed both personally and financially. She not only endured her own arrest following the murder of a, of a master Sprague, but then had to testify at the trial of her two sons. She watched helplessly as her son John was sentenced to death and executed knowing that he was innocent. She watched again helplessly as her son Nicholas was wrongfully imprisoned and then died as a result. And she was forced to deal, deal with the effects of her son William's guilt, drunkenness and institutionalization. She died of kidney failure at the age of 70, less than four months after the arrest of her third son. The youngest brother, Robert, eventually married a woman from Nova Scotia. Her name was Sarah and the couple had seven children all continued to make their home in the city of Providence. Margaret also married. She and a man named John O'Hearn exchanged vows at St. Patrick's Church in Providence. They also made their home in the city. 
It's unknown what became of William's daughter, although it's presumed that Ellen or one of the other family members took her in. Even more impactful in the wrongful execution of John Gordon, for me, was the impact of bigotry and hatred on the family and the community. When John was tried and wrongfully executed for a murder he clearly did not commit, America ceased to be the land of opportunity. The government could no longer be trusted by anyone of Irish descent or of Catholic faith. The courts could no longer be viewed as a place for the administration of justice. The execution of John Gordon preordained so much more than the death of one innocent man. For an entire culture of Irish immigrants, it signified the death of innocence itself. Yet these events took place in the mid 19th century, a long time ago. One might think there's no way that such things could occur in our lifetime. Yet that's exactly what happened more than a century later when in 1959, an Irish Catholic president campaigning to be president was met with similar bigoted questions about whether or not if elected, he might take his marching orders from the Pope of Rome. More recently in the election of 2012, religion was again front and center when questions arose about the fitness of a Mormon to hold the presidency. While the target groups seem to change throughout history, bigotry, hatred, and prejudice seem constants in our society. But as American poet, author, and philosopher Henry David Thoreau once said, there is no new news, just old news with new dates. There um, were a lot of events that took place following the uh, Gordon execution. Um, so I'd like to jump up to coming day. And uh, Jim had mentioned the, um, the uh, pardon of John Gordon. Advance a couple of slides very much. A couple more. Right there. Uh, Ken Dooley, prominent author and historian uh, and playwright, wrote Murder Trial. You can't, you know, unfortunately, a lot of it's off the screen, but the murder trial of John Gordon. I had been, um, I had a meeting February 2000 and I don't know, I guess it was 2013. And the um, meeting was in Warwick. It was a cold, miserable February night. And I ventured up there, it was rainy and icy. And when I got there, I found out the meeting was canceled. So I took the back roads to get home because of the ice. And I, um, I come to the Park Cinema in Cranston. And on the marquee is the murder trial of John Gordon. I now had no place to be. And it looked interesting. So I called Marge and asked if she wanted to, to go and she didn't. So, <laughs> so I did what every good husband would do. I went alone. <laughs> and um, I was just amazed by the things I had seen at this play. In fact, when I walked out, I was shaking my head and I said, it can't possibly be the truth. The playwright had to embellish to make it, you know, make, make the story a bit more interesting. So um, I decided uh, that I would do my own research about it. And I found out that not only was everything in the play 100% accurate, but it only touched on a very small piece of the story. So I, I pitched the topic to the History Press who had published my first book and was after me to write a second. And um, they, they jumped at that opportunity, said they had heard about the story and, and would love me to do that. So that's how uh, I ended up writing this book. But right around the time of, that this play was being uh, was pr produced in, in, um, in, the, in the theater, the legislature was looking at the possibility of pardoning John Gordon. Uh, Peter Martin, a state representative from Newport, introduced a bill of pardon right after he saw the play. And um, Senator McCaffrey uh, introduced a, a companion bill in the Senate. And several people uh, of... Um, prominence within the community. Uh, some names you're, I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, historian Matt Smith, um, uh, Mike DeLauro, who was public defender at the time, um, Ken Dooley, obviously. Um, Matt, uh, not, uh, Matt uh, Scott Malloy, um, several others testified 
on behalf of, of the bills. And on the strength of their testimony and an amicus brief that was done by the uh, public defender, uh, the legislature saw fit to, to pass the bills of pardon. The governor, uh, Governor Chafee, signed the, uh, the bill of pardon. And on June 29th of 20, 2011, 2011. Yeah, he was, <laughs> um, too many dates in this little head. Um, oh, it's up there, good. <laughs> he, was, um, he was pardoned in the same room in the old state house in which his trial, the trial of John Gordon was, was held. Uh, so that made the, um, gave the, the pardon even greater significance. Um, John Gordon on the, on the next uh, slide, I think, was given a new headstone. Uh, John was originally buried at the um, North, North Cemetery, North Burial Ground, um, but he was in a pauper's grave and the family feared desecration of the, of the grave and the body by the uh, Yankees who weren't exactly thrilled with the whole thing. So um, they, in the, in the darkness of night, exhumed and, and removed the body and brought it to St. Mary, St. Mary Cemetery? Saint Mary. Yeah, St. Mary Cemetery in Pawtucket. Um, it was buried in an undisclosed location there. So in case people got, wind of the uh, removal of the body, they uh, wouldn't be able to go dig it up. And um, it's there to this very day. Now the monument that was uh, erected um, to commemorate the pardon is not on his actual grave because the only person that knew where that was, the pastor of the church, uh, had long since retired and um, I guess either couldn't be found or didn't know anymore the location. So this was just placed at a prominent spot on the grounds of the cemetery. Um, there's also a very interesting stories. Anybody here like ghost stories? There's very interesting stories about the Sprague Mill. And um, my book does go into uh, some of those briefly at the end. Our chapter is called The Haunting of Sprague But um, some of the stories that, a couple of the stories that I can tell you now, I wasn't able to write in the book because the curator of the, um, of the Mansion Museum didn't want those stories in print. But there are several alleged hauntings. This is a, a gravestone of a master sprig. A master's body was also moved. Initially, he was buried in the back of the mansion, but then his body was exhumed and moved to a very large uh, family plot at the Swan Point Cemetery. Uh, from the east side, and um, the headstone was just left buried uh, on the grounds. So when, years later, when a lot of the land was sold, the original land uh, of the mansion was far more extensive than it is today. And when that land was sold to build some houses in the development there, uh, they started to dig the, for the foundations, and they found several bodies, uh, skeletons, um, that after examination turned out to be employees of the Spriggs who really didn't have any family and their bodies were just buried in the backyard when they died without benefit of a coffin or a grave. They just dug a hole and threw them in. Um, no headstones. But a mass's headstone was buried along with some of those bodies. So there's a fragment of the headstone that is now in the mansion. And the mansion is alleged to be, it was actually named the most haunted mansion in America. And that's saying a lot, looking at some of the mansions we have throughout the country. But um, it was uh, haunted, allegedly haunted by several people, including a master Sprague. Um, the uh, Civil War Governor William Sprague, the, the fifth, uh, was married to Lincoln, President Lincoln's Treasury Secretary's daughter. Um, and apparently they had a very close relationship. And um, they had an ugly divorce years later, and she is alleged to have haunted the mansion. Um, his son, Governor Sprague's son, um, committed suicide, and most people think it was in the stairway here, and he has been haunting the mansion. And um, 
See, I think it's a few ones. So there's a doll room up in the mansion. Oh, these slides are a little fuzzy. They, they're clear on uh, on the slide. I guess it's the, uh, the focus that's a little off. But this uh, upper slide is, of, which again, is partial view off the screen. It's a doll room, which is on the second floor of the mansion. It's one of the bedrooms that the children uh, used. And there are a host of ceramic dolls in the bedroom. It was old fashioned uh, Victorian type dolls. And there's a, a shelf and they're just lined up on the shelf. And staff at the mansion report, uh, reported that they would come in in the morning and find those dolls scattered on the bed and on the floor throughout the room. They put them back on the shelves and maybe a, a week or two later come back and they were all scattered around again. And it was clear that they just didn't fall because if they fell, uh, they were drake. They were porcelain. Um, it looked like they were placed and, you know, someone had been playing with them. So it's alleged that the children also want the mansion. Um, this mirror here in the living room uh, is a mirror that um, uh, Chase, the, the wife of the Civil War governor, um, allegedly appeared in when one of the guests was in the hotel, or in the hotel, in the mansion. Um, so that room is haunted. And this, um, that's called a what? <laughs> Shadow box. And it contains blocks of, of hair of uh, some of the sprigs. One time they heard a loud noise downstairs and they, they went and looked and that had fallen off the wall. But it had fallen with enough force to make a loud noise downstairs. Yet somehow it jumped over this marble top table and it landed on the floor here, and it wasn't damaged at all. The glass didn't break, and it was just hung, we hung on the wall. So there's um, some strange things that go on there in the mansion. And uh, if you believe in ghosts, it's um, it's haunted. <laughs> um, I, I do want to take questions, but I want to want to start with uh, the answer to two questions that I get all the time. So before someone asks them here, let me just tell you what the answer is. Um, there are two things. The first is, why did William not disclose that he hid the guns? Clearly, that would have exonerated John, or gone a long way toward his exoneration, because that would have re removed that gun as the possible murder weapon, and that would have taken the gun out of John's hands. So um, William knew that. He obviously took the guns and hid them. And he hid them up um, on the second floor of the store was the apartment. And in the bedroom of the apartment, there was a, a carpet, a rug, and if you lifted that, there was a loose floorboard. And if you lifted up that floorboard, that's where he placed the gun. Then he replaced the floorboard, put the carpet back. And so it wasn't found, but he was able to lead the investigators there after he had admitted it. Um, too late for John. And that's what John meant when he said, it's you, William, who have hung me. The only person that William told that he moved the guns was John. And the only time he told them was when they got to court because he wasn't able to see him before that. So um, he told him in the courtroom and John knew that that wasn't good for him. Um, William, on the other hand, had a, an alibi that was airtight. Why? Because it came from a Yankee, not an Irishman. Uh, Yank, when the Gordons were attending a christening that day at the parish hall. And William left a little bit early to walk home to visit his mother who had been sick. And along the way, right around the time that the murder was being committed, he bumped into a Yankee, another mill owner. And they spoke for about 20 minutes. And then William continued on his way. That mill owner testified at the trial that couldn't have been William. I was talking to him at the time that the murder was, and they believed him because he was Yankee. But no Yankee could testify on behalf of John because he stayed at the christening. All the people at the christening could certainly testify on his behalf and did, but that was irrelevant because they were Irish. So um, that's why William was exonerated. And that's why 
oh, I didn't tell you why William hid the goods. An island, apparently, uh, because it was a depressed colony of England at the time still. Um, if a crime was committed, a murder was committed, and an Irishman was uh, accused of the crime, <clears throat> and it was found that he owned a gun or had a gun, it was automatic guilt. 9.9 .9 times out of 10, he'd be executed, charged, and executed for the crime. That's what William knew when he came to this country. He didn't know things were different here. All he knew was, if they find these guns, my brothers are goners. So as soon as they were arrested, he went to the store, grabbed them, and hid them. After the fact, his, by telling that story, he certainly could have helped John out a great deal. But he was afraid. Why? because he'd be admitting to tampering with evidence, to obstruction of justice, and to a host of other things that he now would be convicted of, even though he was exonerated for the murder. So he just lost his nerve and was afraid to tell the truth. When John was out of options, that's when he finally said, hey, what do I have to lose? He was going to live with the guilt for the rest of his life. So he didn't care anymore at that point. He just told the truth but it was still too late because they wouldn't uh, allow the second trial. So with that, are there any questions that you have? Um, are you familiar with the Hoffman's book? Yes. What do you think of their premise that the uh, senator? <laughs> I, I, the book, first of all, was excellent. Mm. It's excellent. Um, and I used it a, a great deal in my own research. The problem was, I think, with his... Um, let me, let me back up. For those who may not be familiar with Hoffman's book, husband, wife, team, both professors, one at URI, oh, the mic one at Rift, one at Rift. Use the mic. Okay. Technology. Is that good? Use the mic, you just have to talk loud. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The, um, the Hoffman's, uh, the question was what did I think of the premise of the Hoffman book? Hoffman's were a husband and wife team of professors, I think one from URI, one from Rick, if I'm not mistaken. And they wrote a book called Brotherly Love. And the book alleges that William Sprague, who resigned his US Senate seat to lead the investigation into the um, murder of his brother, um, was actually the murderer. And in fact, the, the, the logic behind that is plausible. Master Sprague and William uh, and um, Senator Sprague, William Sprague, um, were at odds constantly for several reasons. Uh, William wanted to be a mill owner. He really didn't want to be in politics. His father pushed him in that direction, and he pushed a master to take over the mill. So there was a resentment there because of that. Then. William didn't think that Amasa was running the mill appropriately. Times were really good, like, like they were just a few months ago in this country. And he wanted to expand the mills. And Amasa didn't. Amasa was a little more pragmatic, more conservative. And he said, no, times aren't always going to be good. And when the, when the economy starts to go downhill, if we own too much, we probably won't be able to survive that. So they fought over that. And because uh, William, although he was in the Senate and not charged with running the mill, still owned the mill. They, they, you know, the family owned it together. So um, he felt he was losing money and he could do a better job running the mill. Sure enough, right after Amasa was murdered, William Sprague did, did take over the operation of the mill. And he also expanded the mill just like he had wanted to. Unfortunately for him, Amass's predictions were right on, and the economy did go downhill, I don't know, like 15, 20, 25 years later, uh, the Spriggs ended up losing the mill to bankruptcy. And the ironic thing there was, uh, just one of those only in Rhode Island stories, the, um, the trustee for the bankruptcy was uh, a Chafee. He was a, an ancestor of Governor Chafee, who pardoned Gordon. Um, so uh, in any case, there, there's plausible um, <laughs> denial, I guess, 
uh, there to, to think that, yeah, it could have been William, but there's just no, no hard evidence. It's more circumstantial evidence, just like they used to, to uh, convict John Gordon. So it's impossible at, at this point in time to try to pin, pin blame on anybody because the evidence was destroyed. The, um, you know, the, there's nothing left to, to base it other than circumstantial evidence and, and stories. There's nothing to base fact on fact. Um, but there's several people that could have been involved in the murder that they never bothered to investigate. Uh, probably the most prominent of those is a guy named Big Pete, Pete Dolan. Um, Big Peter was an employee of the Sprague Mill, and he was fired by a master Sprague about a week before Christmas. And they certainly, you know, uh, Dolan certainly didn't appreciate a master Sprague at all. Um, he was a very big man, hence the name Big Pete. And he, um, there was a coat that was found near the scene of the crime with red stuff on it that was presumed to be blood. There was no blood piping back then or DNA. So it looked red, it must be blood. Although John Gordon was trying to say that it was red matter, red dye from one of the mills. But um, be that as it may, it was a, presumed to be a blood-stained coat that was so big that it wrapped around John Gordon twice. Now, John was tall and thin, uh, much like me. <laughs> that wasn't funny. Um, and he, um, we're laughing because we were thinking the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> Great minds. Um, so anyway, he, he was told and the coat wrapped around him twice, at least twice. And uh, despite that, they were trying to you know, make up reasons. The prostitute said, oh, I've seen him wearing that coat before. In fact, he used to fold it up and put it on the seat of the carriage and sit on it uh, when, you know, when he, when he wanted a more cushion. And um, then when it got cold, he would wear it. Well, you know, she, she said a lot of things, but she was clearly lying most of the time. Um, she wouldn't even tell the real name, by the way, at the, uh, uh, the real name of her matter. She wouldn't tell it to, to try it. Um, but uh, in any case, um, he was a prime candidate for, you know, to, to look at as, as the murderer. Um, the coat fit him perfectly. And he disappeared the day after the murder, never to be found again. Now, some say he went back to Ireland. I doubt that because the conditions there weren't so uh, welcoming at the time. Um, others say he moved to Pennsylvania and he died in Philadelphia and gave a deathbed confession to his priest. Now, that's suspect as well because um, if you know anything about Catholic priests, they would go to their own grave before they would reveal a confession. So it's unlikely that a priest would say, oh yeah, they confessed to the crime on his deathbed. Um, but who knows, you know, stranger things have happened. So um, he was a prime candidate, but they never looked at him because they really wanted to just blame it on the Gordons. Um, because Nick, Nick was, Nicholas Gordon, Nick, it sounds like I'm an old friend. Nicholas Gordon was, was um, dangerous. You know, he was becoming wealthy. He uh, owned land, so he could now vote. Back at this time, um, the way they controlled the political structure was they would deed, because you had, to, you had to be two things to vote, naturalized citizen, and you had to be, um, you had to own land, at least $200 worth of land, 185, I think. Um, so what the land, what the mill owners would do is they would deed a piece of their land that went along with the mill, just a lot or two, over to one of their mill workers. And then now that that, it was a quick claim deed, so now that mill owner had land, he would go vote. At the same time he signed that quick claim deed, he signed a second deed reclaiming the land back to the uh, mill owner. But during that time that he owned it, they would take him to the polls and watch him as he voted, to supervise his vote to make sure he voted the way the mill owner wanted him to vote. If he didn't, he'd be fired unceremoniously. Most of the time they just did. And then as soon as he cast the vote, they went and recorded the second deed, claiming the land back to the mill owners. So 
you know, you got, I don't know, a couple of hundred mill uh, Irish people working for you in the mill, and you um, got those guaranteed votes, and you own two, three, four mills like the Spriggs did, it's hard to lose power. <laughs> so, but anyway, um, yeah, so Do Dolan was, was a, a prime suspect in my mind. And the third one, I think, is um, there were two, two witnesses, Spencer and Spencer and Bowen, Bowen, Spencer. Bowen, Spencer, and William Barker. They were both headed for tea with Spencer's father uh, on the day of the murder. And they said that as they were walking to the father's house, they bumped into two, two men fitting the description of John and William. One was wearing a coat, the other one was carrying a gun. And they assumed they were going hunting, although they thought it odd on a cold day to be hunting with, you know, one with no coat, the other with no gun. But that was their assumption. They went and had tea, and then they were coming back a few hours later. They saw the same two men testify. This time, neither one of them had a coat on. And they were walking with their head down very fast and, you know, not looking in, at anybody. So, you know, that was evidence of the two. Now, clearly it wasn't William Gordon because we, we know that he was talking to the other, the other Yankee at the time. Um, so it probably wasn't John Gordon either, but it didn't matter. Um, but they were in the, they self-identified themselves as being in the vicinity of the murder at the time of the murder. And yet nobody questioned them as to, oh, how do we know you went to your father's house? <laughs> so they were, they, were, they were potential suspects as well. Um, yes? Autopsy is what must have been very extensive where you were able to realize he was shot in the hand, he had braces on his head and they had his head split open. Yeah, they actually did two there autopsies. There no witnesses, I mean. No, they actually did two autopsies though. And both medical reports still exist. Um, there was one done, because he was murdered on the Johnston side of the bridge, um, the Johnston medical examiner uh, took the body back to, first he, he did a, an initial examination right at the scene, and then he took the body back to his, um, whatever they called it, his office, <laughs> and he did a, what they used to call an autopsy back then, it was more just an examination of the body, but he did a thorough examination in his office. And then he brought the body to the Sprague Mansion. And when it was at the Sprague Mansion, the Sprague family hired their own doctor to come in and do a second examination. So both left extensive notes on the injuries and the presumed cause of death. And because of that, I was able to piece together what had happened. Though it may not be exactly like, you know, like that, but it's a reasonable a reasonably good description of what probably took place that day. Yes, sir. You gave great detail of the act after the murder. And I'm wondering, is, is that based on investigation, the investigative report that you research or is it a literary license? It's uh, about 90% of the first, based on those two autopsy reports and about 10% of literary license. Um, there, there are probably other ways it could have happened. Uh, you know, there's other ways that the, that the um, for example, maybe the gun didn't shatter when it was on that final uh, smack against the mass's uh, forehead. Maybe it shattered earlier, but we know that it was shattered and we know that the mass lived right through that final beating. So, a good assumption that that's when it shattered. So about 90 10. Kind of. How long after this thing were hanging about in Rhode Island? Okay, this hanging was Valentine's Day, 1845. And um, the death penalty was abolished in Rhode Island seven years later in 1852. Um, it took that long because it took that long for the door rights to take control of the legislature. And once they gained control of the, of the General Assembly, they were able to pass a uh, bill banning all um, executions. Now,
Now in other states, there were two other states that banned uh, execution for capital crime, for, for murder. But Rhode Island was the, uh, before we did it, Rhode Island was the first state to ban capital punishment for all crimes, not just capital crimes. Back then, stealing your neighbor's horse was a capital crime and you could be hanged for that. So, um, you know, we, we abolished the death penalty for all crimes, not just murder. Anyone else? Yes. Oh, well, 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 I'm just curious, uh, you mentioned something about the descendants. Um, is there any history of the descendants? Were they able to be a part of the party? They reached out to whatever family by putting ads in the newspapers. Uh, they tried to contact whatever family members might still exist. Um, presumably there are some because they had a lot of kids. Um, but we don't know if they're in the state, out of the state. None of them showed up, or if any of them did, they didn't identify themselves as, as descendants. Sure. How long did it take to write a book like this? Inception to um, the actual, I write a little differently than most people do. Most people will do all the research and then take all the research and write. I write as I research, and then I just reorganize things after the fact. So I think that saves a little time. So it takes me about um, most books, seven or eight, nine months to write. It takes about three months, maybe four months to go through the publishing process. And that includes the editing process. Um, so, you know, roughly a year, little, maybe a little bit more than a year. Um, when it's really, you know, when I have nothing to do, I'll write two books in a year. Uh, like during the pandemic, I couldn't go out and speak about the books. I couldn't sell books at fairs and shows. So I had nothing to do except write. So I wrote two books that year. I'm hoping to write two this year. Anyone else? Well, thank you very much. I certainly appreciate your attention. Thank you very much, Paul. That was very interesting. That was quite the gruesome description of the hanging. <laughs> but then he got it through me with the ghost stories. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that at all. Uh, just in closing, I want to just bring this back to the Irish community and, and things like that. And uh, people in Northern Ireland are very familiar with this kind of injustice, this kind of framing, this kind of uh, execution and things like that. And just to quickly, if anybody here is interested and in, hasn't seen the movie In the Name of the Father about the Birmingham Six, it's a, I'm sure you get it on Netflix, In the Name of the Father, it's a, quite an education. Uh, but in this country, there are people fighting against this kind of injustice. There's an organization called the Innocence Project. This is their mission statement. They were formed in 1992. They work to free the innocent, prevent wrongful convictions, and create fair, compassionate, and equitable systems of justice for everyone. The work is based on science and grounded in anti-racism. Tucker Carlson would go ballistic to <laughs> everybody there. I, and I just want to say two words, Patty Wagon, okay? When you yes. talk about anti-Irish, yes. Patty Wagon is quite the thing. Now, the reason it got that name was apparently because the Irish used to drink and fight so much they needed a bigger vehicle to take them to the jail. I don't think I'm the only one here that got a ride in a paddy wagon down to LaSalle Square where the old police station. <laughs> but for those of you who didn't have that experience, a paddy wagon was a box, it was like a van. And in the back of the van, it had two benches against the wall. There were no seat belts, there were no nothing. And you would sit against the wall and get a ride down to wherever the police station was. 
I had the good fortune of meeting the chief of police in Providence. His name is Clemens. He was a grand marshal, I think, in the Providence parade. But anyway, they were, we were at a gathering. I was having to sit next to him. We started talking, cop talk or whatever. And I mentioned, I said, what about this paddy wagon? How, you know, you understand it's back in the day, they were Irish people. How come it never got called a Tony wagon? <laughs> or a Jose wagon, like as the immigrant groups change, but it's stuck paddy wagon, you know? And they no longer use them in this country. And the reason why is because before George Floyd got murdered, in Baltimore, a guy named Freddie Gray was arrested for some misdemeanor. He was put in the back of a paddy wagon and handcuffed. He was left alone there. They took him for an eight mile drive stopping and starting turning corners and he just crew, uh, crashed back and forth in the back of the thing he didn't die in the wagon he died at a hospital after he got out of the paddy wagon but it, it's you know an indication of the fact that it was still called the paddy wagon i remember reading it in the paper they kept saying they put freddie gray in the back of a paddy wagon and i don't want to get into any other name such so a call it with freddie gray but that's you know that was the end of paddy wagons in this country, fortunately. Uh, the Innocence Project has freed 375 people have been exonerated by just by DNA testing, okay? So it shows you how sophisticated it is, how many people are unjustly incarcerated. 21 of them were on death row. And of the 375, 60% were African Americans demonstrated the kind of bias that, you know, the Irish faced in, in this story, et cetera. And so just in closing, I think it's important that we who have survived this kind of prejudice and have done quite well for ourselves in the Irish American community, keep in mind that this kind of injustice, this kind of stuff still goes on where people get framed, you know, because of where they're from or because of their accent or because of what the general prejudice is against a, a group of immigrants. And, you know, as we go on with our organization here and we're trying to find unity in Ireland and we live in this country and this still goes on here and we should, you know, stand up for justice and stand up against this kind of frame that goes on. So with that, God, I just like to remind everybody Thursday night down at the Fairman site, we're going to have a hunger strike commemoration. And please come up. <laughs> this is quite an array of books. Like, if he's telling me he's doing those in seven or eight months, he <laughs> must spend a lot of time right? <laughs> wow, that's all day, every day. All day, every day. Wow, you're a better man than me. But anyway, there's a, quite a collection. It covers a whole lot of different things. We'll be back here on uh, the last Friday in May. Have a good another lecture, and I hope to see everybody here again. Thank you, Paul. That was great stuff. That was uh, quite a tale.